Here we are on Queen's Road in Hull and we're just looking now at the Campanile of St Vincent's Church which is standing above the tree over there. A little bit of traffic noise will get I'm afraid. If I pan round you can see the school there behind the, the trees again and round again that's the Saint, old St Vincent's Club. Originally it was the Presbytery and now it's out of the parish hands and in the hands of the Buffaloes. In front of us now we have the church. <coughs> if we look down the driveway down towards the end we can see the old St Vincent's Orphan Boys Home which is now sold off and his private flats. If I lean back a little bit you can see up the Campanile there and you see the two Cairo's on the top. The Campanile is lit up when it's night time. Swinging round again we see the front of the church and over the top there over the door we can see one of the first of the mosaics. I'm now at the side gate of the church and looking at one of our many mosaics. This is our patron, St Vincent de Paul. And as I scan down, you can see the whole of the mosaic. It's locked at the moment, so I'm having to film through the grill. I've started our look at the inside of the church in the northeast corner. And we're looking at the Sacred Heart Chapel, one of the side chapels. And there is a statue of the Sacred Heart, not at all unusual in Catholic churches. To the left of it, you can see our first Holy Communion tree. And that's where the children who are currently studying towards the first Holy Communion have made a little picture or something personal to themselves and used it to decorate the tree. If I move forward at this point and just perhaps video in a little bit you can see there the first of the internal mosaics I'm showing and that shows Noah and the Flood. Probably very apt at this moment with coronavirus being as busy as it is and the world turned upside down as it was by the great flood. But water of course has a high symbolic place in Christianity. We talk of the water of life and in the Middle East where Christianity began you could say that water is life. If I zoom out again and move slowly around we can see the church as we go, but we can also have a quick look at the fonts. Now the fonts again is our symbolic water and that's where our children are baptised. The font was moved here at the time of the golden jubilee of the church. It was originally at the back and the pulpit, which was just behind where the font stands now, was removed at that time. There were quite a few changes that were done in line with the recommendations of the Second Vatican Council, which had been some years earlier. Again, as I move up, I can see over here, I'll just pull in a little bit on this. And that's the first of our Stations of the Cross. One of the things early Christians often aspired to was a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, where they could walk in the steps of Christ as he went from Pilate's palace up to the hill of Calvary and eventually down to the tomb. Well, most people couldn't do that, so they established a, a sort of early virtual experience, which was 14 stations of the cross, showing the main points of Christ's journey. And these 14 
are depicted on these stations as we go around the church, seven on this side and if we look across the other side you can just pick out seven on the other side. So that's our stations of the cross and the term stations is because that's where people who were walking around the church praying as they reached each station would stop and say a little sequence of prayers. Now as I move forward a little bit you can see a bit more detail on the cross and this is we call it the Oppie Wood Cross. Now the story behind the cross is that Oppie Wood was a place in France where a lot of whole suns fell during the First World War. And the decision was made to erect a memorial at Oppie Wood. And the memorial was designed by Mr. Brownsword of the Hull College of Art and he made a model of it, or a prototype of it, in Hull as part of the fundraising effort. And the actual Oppiewood Memorial is in the cemetery at Oppiewood, and it's made out of marble. But when the fundraising was complete, then the cross became available. And uh, Father Macken, later Canon Macken, who was then building the new church, decided to try and get it for the parish, which he did. So this is the Oppiewood Cross prototype. It's got a few unusual points. If you look at the feet, the feet are both side by side and individually nailed. And normally, when you see a crucifix, the feet will be crossed over and the single nail driven through. Looking underneath it, you can see the sign of the Holy Spirit, the dove. Now normally, again, that would have been above the cross. In most churches it is, but obviously the limitations of getting a, a pre-existing cross meant it was easier to mount it at the bottom. Looking below the, the sign of the Holy Spirit, the dove, you have the tabernacle, and just in front of the tabernacle is where the altar originally stood. Now this altar, was, which was the high altar, is a stone altar, and it tends to be favoured in Catholic churches because a lot of the early Christians used to say Mass in the catacombs and graveyards and they'd like to say their Mass on the sarcophagus of a, a noted local martyr. So for that reason we, we often don't tend to use a simple wooden table as a lot of the nonconformists do. Again, the altar was brought forward so the priest could stand behind it facing the congregation at the same time as the pulpit was taken out and the, the font was moved. And at this time also the altar rails were removed from the front of the altar, leaving the step, you can just see the step at the bottom of the film there. And that step was originally where people would have knelt to receive Holy Communion. Nowadays they line up and receive Communion as they go and standing up rather than kneeling down. At the side of the altar we've got our gongs and I'll just put them in on them a little bit. And the bells which are rung at various points parts of the services to let the congregation know exactly what is happening. Again with the altar, you can see the mosaic there, the hearts panting for water. I'll just home in again on that. 
and just behind it I won't move in too much you can see the top of one of our other mosaics so there's plenty of them about and as I said before the theme was about water I'll just turn them right in and you can see the individual pieces of the mosaics now the mosaics in the church I understand were made by a man called Cyril Gasparelli and Cyril I don't know if he was actually Italian born or if he was of Italian parentage but the name's a bit of a giveaway and he did mosaics and terrazzos around the Hull area and he certainly left his mark on Hull in the best possible way moving to the right again one of the sort of changes just before the golden jubilee and all these changes were made to fit in with the recommendations of the second vatican council and you can see the lectern there and again the letters on the lectern were taken from the original altar rails where the gates for the altar rails were as you come into the, the altar a brief word here we mentioned Father Macken Father Macken came originally from Slane in West Meath in Ireland after his ordination he came to the Middlesbrough Diocese and found his way down into Hull in 1927 he immediately set about fundraising because the old church was sat on top of the school and he decided it was time we had a proper church in the area so he set about fundraising and this was in the middle of the, the Great Depression and this was not a prosperous part of Hull but by 1932 he'd raised enough money to commence the building of the church and in 1933 the church was opened so it was quite a feat at the time the campanile as you saw as we started the video was added which was rather strange because it's not uh, usual to have bells in a Catholic church and a lot of people said it was an extravagance but he did insist that this was going to be a really great church and it needed a campanile so shortly after the church was opened the campanile actually did start to lean become the leaning tower of Hull as it were and it had to be underpinned very seriously in order to keep it upright but it has remained there since then and nowadays the campanile is lit up and acts like a beacon during the night I've now moved across to Our Lady's Chapel or sometimes known simply as the Lady Chapel and most Catholic churches will have a, a statue of the child Jesus held by his mother so a very common sort of iconic part of the, the church fittings moving round we can see the candle holder for the votive candles and moving across the other way we see the container for holy water water is very symbolic in Catholicism in fact in the whole of Christianity and you see the little fish there which is also the low case of the letter alpha which I'll explain a bit more about later on and just behind or above the fish we've got the Cairo which you'll see a lot of in the church if you go online I won't try and explain the whole thing but if you go online uh, there's quite a lot about it 
And underneath, there we have it, let's zoom in a little bit. We've got a scene of the sea. And Mary is the star of the sea. So again, that's another one of our little mosaics. This is the sacristy door. Behind it you've got various storage things. You've also got the dressing room, as it were, where the priest would put his robes on and the altar servers. To the far right you can see the last of the stations of the cross and Jesus is laid in the tomb. Up on the wall we've got our sanctuary bell. Just pull back a bit so you can see that. And the actual cord to ring that bell is inside the sacristy and one of the servers would ring the bell when the priest was about to emerge from the sacristy and the people would stand, the organist would strike up and the singing of the hymns would begin. Talking of the organ, coming back from here, let's just move around. And there's the pipes of the organ. So, reckon to be the second best organ in Hull, I'm told after the City Hall. So it's still played and still in good working order. Here I've moved to the back of the church and I'm currently in the southeast corner and this is a chapel dedicated to our patron St Vincent de Paul. He's shown here, he had a very interesting life. He was a galley slave at one point. I won't tell you his whole story there, because this is simply a quick tour. But it's well worth reading. So I would recommend it to anybody. Here, homing in on the decoration, we've got three fish in rotational symmetry and also slight tessellation. And the fish is important, it was an important symbol to the early Christians, they used it for recognition. And again, it's as well to go online and get the full story here, because it's, it's quite complex. But we mentioned how the fish, is, or the sign of the fish, was also very much like the low case alpha. And we'll talk about the alpha and omega in a second. And again, long before the time of Christ, the fish was regarded as a symbol of knowledge. Moving into St Vincent's Chapel, we've got our little war memorials here, and people from the parish served in both wars. This particular one is for the parishioners killed during the Second World War. And if you look carefully, you might be able to see some of the names. It's, uh, I'm afraid the sun's on it at the moment, so it's not uh, as brilliant as it should be. Over here we have the First World War Memorial. There's a figurine of a Tommy, which is quite a recent addition. Though the, the actual brass plate behind is as old as the church itself. And part of the memorial was this triptych picture. Now the idea of the triptych is that you, you can close the wing pictures over the top of the sensor picture and save the colours if it's in direct sunlight. So you've got a very common image in the middle, the crucifixion. But on the, the sides you've got two saints you don't often see in juxtapositions, they belong to different times and different places. On the left you have St. Patrick, probably reflecting the makeup of the early part of the parish when a lot of the people would have been either Irish or part, part of the Irish diaspora. 
And on the other side you've got St Vincent's of course, who is our parish patron. Looking towards the very south of the church, we have the main entrance and the doors going out onto the street. Either side you have the confessionals, which are a very important part of the church activity. And in the old days you would have had a curate as well, so you'd have had two priests hearing confessions in the censer, through the censer door, and the penitents would go either side. Nowadays, we only keep the one in use and the other one acts as storage for general things. Looking at the door and the decoration, you've got the vine, of course, up the side. But also, if I move in a little closer, you've got once again the Alpha sign and at the other side of it well, that's one of our uh, modern health and safety signs which tend to ruin the line of it somewhat I'm afraid but, and there's the Omega and God is the Word and when we speak of Christ we say the Word made flesh and dwelt amongst us and of course writing was very important and you needed your alphabet and the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet are the Alpha and the Omega and it's very important because God is the beginning and he is also the end as well as being the Word. Looking up above we have a plaque now this plaque records the installation of the organ and it was done 1939 to 45 was the war and we were very lucky during the war because while the significant bomb damage around the church the church which was new at that time was spared so people were very grateful for that. Homing in for the final part, we have two of our statues here. We've got St. Joseph and we've also got St. Teresa. Two very important saints in the Christian canon, as it were. And we seem to do very well for statues here. We've got quite a few probably inherited a few when the home closed, I would imagine. And over here, we've got a painting, very common icon within Christianity. And this is Our Lady of Perpetual Succor. Succor as in succor, or succor, the French would shout. And it's help or assistance, Our Lady of Perpetual Help or Assistance. And I don't know how well this will come out now because but over here we've got again a, a memorial window erected by the priest and people of St Vincent's to mark the diamond jubilee of the church 1933 to 1993 and it's got a picture of the Humber Bridge on it not normally a religious symbol but it's probably the most momentous thing that's happened in Hull, apart from the war, during that period. So here we are, once again, looking around the church. And thank you for looking at our little church.